thank you very much for that warm introduction, and uh, thank you all to Uma, uh, to Dr. Abadi, uh, and the uh, Executive Committee for this uh, very kind uh, invitation to address you. I'm humbled to be here among uh, great scholars and uh, uh, to talk at a conference dedicated to Imam Hussein, uh, who ever since I got into Middle East studies and learned the history, uh, is someone, uh, you know, uh, I'm a little bit rebellious, uh, and I, I really, really dislike injustice. So, you know, for all of us who have that temperament, Imam Hussein is a great hero. Uh, so it's, it's wonderful to be here uh, at a conference dedicated to him. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the Middle East, uh, and to take the focus off of uh, what is usually the focus, which is nowadays uh, sectarianism. Because as a social historian, I see sectarianism not as the cause of anything, uh, but as uh, the result of other processes, political processes, social processes. That is to say, I'm making an argument that nobody in Syria got up in the morning and said, oh, that person is an Alawi, I'm a Sunni, therefore I must attack them. Uh, that never happened. And that's not how the current events began. Uh, what, what has led to this period of uh, political instability and faction fighting uh, in the eastern part of the Middle East uh, is a complex set of, uh, of developments um, that are much deeper than surface identities. Uh, the first what I'd like to underline, uh, which is very clear uh, now from the uh, research, is, uh, is that there's been a long-term drought in this region, uh, beginning at least in 2004. And Syria in particular has suffered very deeply from this drought. And I think this is the kind of thing you never see in the newspapers, and it, it's, it's a more specialized kind of study. You take that eastern desert of Syria, uh, a, a province like Raqqa. The, the, the scientists have looked into this and they found between 2004 and 2010, the drought was so severe in Raqqa that 70% of the livestock, uh, of the sheep and goats, uh, of, of the farmers in that region died. And so many people lost their farms. Well, what happens to you if you lose your farm in Raqqa? You can't, you can't make it. You have to go to a city. So you would go to Homs or Hama, one of those central uh, cities, looking for day labor work. You'd, you'd try to become a construction worker. Uh, but what happened in 2008? The world economy collapsed. There wasn't much construction work. Even the Gulf countries with their oil revenues suffered a profound depression because people drive less when there's an economic crash. Uh, and so they weren't selling as much oil. So those people who went to Homs and Hama and those uh, middle cities looking for work, and you know in Syria it's like France, they put the slums on the outside of the cities, not in the middle of them. Uh, it's much more sensible. Uh, and um, if you look in 2011, when protests began in, in Syria. Some of them were as in the rest of the Middle East, in Egypt and Tunisia and so forth. Some of them were youth protests. Uh, they, they wanted more civil liberties. They wanted more space to be youth uh, than the authoritarian Ba'ath Party was allowing. Uh, but some of them were economic protests. They were, if you looked, at it, a lot of them were happening in those slums around those cities. They were, they were uh, recently arrived workers from the countryside who wanted jobs. And, and they had already suffered enormously because they had been farmers. They had had their own farms and they lost them. Why? Because of the drought. Uh, well, droughts are cyclical in the Middle East. It's not the first drought that anyone has ever seen there. Uh, there was a, a, a really severe drought in the early 70s. But one thing we know for sure is that drought is exacerbated. It's made worse if, if the temperatures are higher, if there's more heat 
Well, and we know that the temperature of the world is one degree centigrade greater now than it was in 1850. So this drought, if it had happened 200 years ago, wouldn't have been as severe as it is now. And there isn't any doubt that this drought and these, these uh, uh, conditions that threw so many people off of their farms in Syria is made worse by climate change. So, you know, climate change is that kind of subject that uh, you think about it as something that's happening in the distant future. You know, uh, now people talk in a science fictional way that Miami will be underwater eventually. Well, that's probably true, but it's going to take a long time for it to happen. But there are climate change related uh, alterations in our lives as human beings on this earth that are happening now. And excessive heat plus drought is one of them, and it's happening now in, in the American Southwest and in California. Every single county in California is in drought at the moment, and the drought is made worse by the fact that we're a degree hotter than we used to be. This problem of lack of water is driving a lot of social dislocation, a lot of social discontent, which I argue then gets worked into other kinds of desperation and politics and, and social breakdown and criminality and, and so forth. The same thing is true in Yemen. Um, I don't think it's widely appreciated enough. Yemen is on the verge of being without water. That's 22 million people may have to find someplace else to live. Uh, we hear in the news that the Houthi movement has taken Taiz, which is Yemen's biggest city. It's, an, it's a, a city full of workshops and industry and farms uh, in, uh, in, in the bottom part of the north of the country. It's out of water. The farmers are complaining. They have no, their, their livestock is dying. They're, they're, they can't bring in their crops. They have no water in Taiz. And in Sana'a, the capital, uh, they have been depending on an aquifer, which is old fossilized underground water, and they have been using it. That aquifer is being drawn down to the point where we think in five years there will be no water in Sana'a. So quite apart from sectarianism, this is a huge social disaster. Uh, it's made worse by the fact that the Yemenis uh, uh, have a... Uh, um, uh, a love for khat, which is a mild narcotic, uh, it's a leaf that, that they chew. Uh, I, I've been there, I've done that. <laughs> it's very pleasant. <laughs> the development economists pull out their hair because, you know, you knock off work about one and then you go and gather with your friends and sit in, and they have these big branches of khat leaves and they chew them. You have to build it up in the side of your cheek and then the juice comes down all day, and after a while, it's, you're, you're very calm. Um, <laughs> and they sit around and, and say poetry and talk, and I actually think that's how the Yemeni revolution occurred. You know, Ali Abdullah Saleh, they wanted him out, and they protested at Change Square in Sana'a, and he wouldn't go, and, but I think they just sat around in these uh, kachus all over the country, and they said, well, he should go, he should go, and they, they talked him out of office eventually. <laughs> Uh, so, but the problem is cut uh, is a water intensive crop and so they're using a, a, a lot of the water that they don't really have uh, to, to grow it. So it's become a, a, a social problem. So when you hear that there are these social dislocations in, 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 in Yemen and there's this movement and there's that movement and there's Al-Qaeda and there's the Houthis and, and people are fighting and so forth, the social background of that is that people are losing their farms. They, they have no money. And a little bit of money used to come in from the petroleum, but that's going away. Uh, and, and now because of the socialist dislocation, it, not much of it is, is happening. So this is the first thing I want to say, is that there's a severe research, I mean resource crunch in this region. And we can talk about Iraq in this regard too. The, the waters of the Tigris and the Euphrates are much less than they used to be. You take a province in Iraq like Maysan province, 50% of the farmland uh, has too much salt in it. It's become salinized because there's not as much water reaching it uh, from the river. Uh, and um, and that, that leaches 
toxins and salts out of the soil. Uh, well, what would you expect then but that people would uh, uh, be forced off of their farms and there's this vast dislocation and social migration? And when people are forced into a new situation uh, uh, away from their original village, their original family and homeland, uh, they're lost. They're looking for something. And sometimes what they find is a relatively radical ideology. Um, so climate change and, and, lack, and drought and lack of water, lack of other kinds of resources, it's a severe lack of electricity in the Middle East. Uh, the, the governments haven't uh, built enough uh, uh, power plants. You can't run your li modern life without electricity. I was once, in, I, I lived in India for a while. I went out to a, a small town and I talked to a factory owner. I said, how's business? He said, it's terrible. He said, I can't run my factory more than three or four hours a day because I don't get the electricity. They're brownouts. They're uh, what they call in South Asia load shedding. Well, that's true in Iraq. It's, it's true in, 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 in Yemen. Uh, so. Uh, we, we focus on these surface identities. Why are people fighting? People fight when they don't have enough resources. They, there's not enough to go around, and then it, it makes them mean-spirited, and they fight, and, and they can find all kinds of reasons to fight, and, you know, uh, uh, religious or political identity is only one. That's one thing that's happening. Another thing that's happening is that we've, we're seeing the end in the Middle East of a great social experiment. Most of the Middle East was colonized by the French and the British. In the eastern part, it was after World War I. You know, um, the British and the French uh, at that time ruled much of the world, and they were rather arrogant about it. Uh, and they treated these regions as kind of, you know, toys that they were trying to get. So there was a dispute after World War I, Britain wanted Mosul, which is now in northern Iraq, and uh, they, they knew there was some oil there and they wanted to add it into their, the areas they had conquered of Iraq during World War I. And the French also wanted Mosul, and the Turks wanted Mosul. So it was kind of a tug of, a tug of war. Who, who would get Mosul? So the story is that uh, uh, Lloyd George, uh, the, uh, the British prime minister, went to see the French uh, uh, prime minister and uh, uh, and uh, he said, uh, we want Mosul. So the, you know, the, the, the British had done some favors for the French. Clemenceau said, you shall have it. Lloyd George was amazed. He said, they gave us Mosul so easily, I should have asked for more. This was the mentality that they had at that time. They were dividing up the world. Uh, and that colonial experiment didn't do people much good as far as I can see. It's not like they founded a lot of schools or they tried to develop the country or they made factories. They were just extracting resources from those countries or they're using them for strategic purposes. After World War I, the, uh, after World War II, I mean to say, the, the, uh, there was a, a vast movement against these colonial regimes, mostly socialist. And now we're thinking about the Middle East as, as highly religious and so forth. But in the 1950s, they were going communist and Baathist. Baathist is kind of communism light. Uh, and, um, and that was, if you go back and read the newspapers or the US diplomatic dis, uh, dispatches, actually the United States in the 1950s, the, the, the State Department was very concerned about the decline of Islam. They thought, these people are going to become communists like the Chinese. Uh, uh, we have to do something to help Islam. So the Eisenhower administration gave $500 million to the Saudi government to extend the railroad to help Muslims come on Hajj to Mecca. The, the State Department was promoting Hajj. They thought Islam is, you know, a bulwark against communism. Uh, so, you know, the attitude now has changed, but uh, 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 at that time, the big issue was that the Middle East was turning to the left. They turned to a kind of leftist Arab nationalism, and you had these parties like the Ba'ath Party, which said it was socialist and, and uh, Arab nationalist. Actually, you know, socialism doesn't approve of ethnic nationalism, so that was a contradiction. And, you know, it made for trouble, too, because uh, 
you could never convince the Kurds to become really strong Baathists if it meant that they had to think of themselves as Arabs. So it wasn't good in places like Syria or Iraq, uh, uh, which are multicultural. But they took over Syria and Iraq. And the Ba'ath Party was a one-party state. You know, it was very much like Stalinism in Eastern Europe. And they, um, uh, they didn't allow a lot of private uh, enterprise. Uh, everything was run by the government. Uh, it wasn't very efficient. But you know, the one big advantage the government has is that if it wants the factory to be there, the government can make a factory there. So they developed the, these countries that didn't have much industry. Iraq used its oil money in the 1970s under the Ba'ath Party to make pharmaceutical companies and all kinds of, of uh, economic enterprises. And there was an increase in the standard of living. It was politically horrible. I mean, you couldn't criticize the government. People would come for you in the middle of the night and take you away. Uh, and they, they, they crushed, you know, the, the Dawa party uh, in Iraq, the, the, uh, the Shiite uh, uh, party, uh, which had become very popular and executed its leaders. So, uh, you know, the Ba'ath party, politically speaking, was, was uh, a, a set of crimes against humanity. But economically, it, it did you know, and undeniably developed the country. And the same thing was true in Syria, where it built dams, and it uh, did irrigation works, and it, it, it made for uh, some social advance. So you had this contradiction of economic advance, but political re regression and, 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 and repression. Uh, and, and you had the further problem that the Ba'ath Party, as a secular, Arab nationalist, socialist party, just could not represent all the people. It couldn't represent ethnic minorities like the Kurds or the Assyrian Christians. It couldn't represent, uh, it couldn't represent the religiously minded people, so it, it, it typically repressed uh, religious movements. Uh, and uh, again, it was very much like what was going on in Eastern Europe in the same period, where in Poland the Catholic Church was persecuted by the communist government. And all that broke down. Uh, in, uh, in, the, in the 90s, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the socialist model. Uh, and then there was pressure from Washington, London, Paris, the Bretton Woods institutions like the International Monetary Fund on these governments to privatize. And then as they privatized, uh, you know, there was insider trading. Since the government was running the, the economy, when it privatized something, it knew what was going to be privatized so that you could make a phone call to your crony and say, why don't you buy this factory? Here's a good buying opportunity. So a group of billionaires grew up in the place of these socialist regimes in, in, in a place like Syria. So the Al-Assad family and its, uh, and its cousins, the Makhlouf's, they became billionaires out of corruption coming out of this process of what's called neoliberalism or privatization, having the market take over things. And they left out most of the country. So of course, there's going to be enormous protests and uh, dissatisfaction among the people out in the countryside uh, about the al-Assad corruption and the rise of this billionaire class. And, and that was one of the things people were protesting in 2011 and after. Uh, so uh, the protests didn't start, you know, nobody minded they were Alawite billionaires. They minded that they're billionaires and they're blocking other people. You, you know, every time you use your credit card, uh, the, the uh, Visa gets, uh, or MasterCard gets 2.5% uh, 2, 2 from the merchants. You know who that went to in Syria? The, the, the uncle of the president. He got the credit card business. And then Telco went to his cousin and so forth. So. Um, uh, and other people, you, 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 if you weren't in that magic circle, you were being excluded. So the protests in 2011 and after were economic protests. They were unemployment. They were displaced farmers. They, they were protesting this kind of uh, crony uh, capitalism that was growing up with the fall of socialism. It's only when the regime drew up tanks and they, they fired tank shells at, at youth who were protesting. And you know, from the beginning, the, 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 the regime said, this is Al-Qaeda, these are Islamic extremists. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy, because the youth in, in Dara, I remember, they held signs. They're saying, we're not Al-Qaeda, we're youth. Nahna shabab, lasna bi Al-Qaeda. Uh, 
Uh, so um, now I, f I fear it would be the other way around. Uh, but it, wasn't, it didn't start that way. It was, um, uh, it, when, you, when, when the regime repressed people, then it drove them into extremism. And the final thing I want to say as I, as I, as I uh, finish up is that this kind of, of uh, beastly uh, uh, sectarianism that uh, has been adopted by uh, groups like uh, ISIL uh, is, is a plot. I mean, it is a deliberate set of, of uh, revolutionary tactics. They want to what, do what the Marxists call sharpen the contradictions. So they want to uh, they want to, to hit the Shia and make them hit the Sunni because then the Sunni will need somebody to protect them from the Shia and then they show up and miraculously say, we can protect you. This is what they did in Iraq. They kept hitting soft targets. They would blow up a wedding in the Shiite area and then they knew there would be a funeral that evening and they would come back and blow up the funeral. This, this is not just uh, inhumanity. This was a political plot, and it was most often directed by ex Baathist officers who don't believe in God. You know, they have put out the uh, caliphate and all of these things, but this is, this is uh, just a, a rhetoric they have adopted to fool people. It's, it's mostly the, the Baathis who are behind this kind of thing. And, and let me leave you with a story that, uh, uh, that struck me from, from early Islam. Abu Huraira uh, has a hadith in which you know, those Meccan polytheists used to bother the Muslims quite a lot. And uh, one of the Muslims came to the Prophet Muhammad and said, well, uh, Prophet, why don't you curse these people? And I think, you know, the Meccans were superstitious. They thought you, the Prophet could put a curse on uh, somebody and stop them from bothering them. And Abu Huraira says the Prophet was uh, kind of amazed by this question. He said, I didn't come as a curse to people. I came as a mercy. Well, think about this. This was not a story about conflict within the Muslim community. These were polytheists who were persecuting Muslims. And even with regard to them, the prophet said, I came as a mercy, not as a curse. So how would, how would inside Islam, how would people treat each other if they took this story seriously? Uh, so that's, that seems to me uh, a, a spirit of Islam that is present among so many Muslims, uh, but has started to be lacking uh, in the Middle East. Thank you very much.